All right. So uh, I've got homework one here from some of the emails I got. It sounds like you spent the better part of your weekend working on homework. I didn't intend for it to take so long, but when you're doing something unfamiliar for the first time, I, I understand it can take a lot of time. Um, when did you go walk around in the parking lot? Did you do that yesterday? Yesterday would be the perfect day because there was no cars. I know because I was here. <laughs> I was the only car. Maybe Alan Horowitz's car was out there. His car is easy to recognize. <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah, right. And there's a window smashed out. That's the other way. Yeah. He's a good runner, though. All right. Homework number two, Stormcad. Uh, that assignment is going to be due two days from today. And it's going to be very easy assignment. I think that you'll be able to finish that assignment. Well, I finished the key for it in 20 minutes. And so you should probably take 22 or 23 minutes, right, <laughs> to do it. OK, so we're going to do a demonstration on StormCAD today. Before we jump into that demo, um, we're going to actually work the example that we had the, uh, the rational method example. So does anybody? need a copy of this example that we did last time, not bring it? Or anybody here for the first time? It's this rational method example. And what we're going to do is use the same, um, all the same information that we had built our spreadsheet with. And we're going to check to see if maybe there's an easier method for designing pipes than the spreadsheet that we constructed. And of course, there will be an easier method. Uh, but we're going to verify all of the diameters that are indicated here. Now, one thing I need to point out is sometimes it's a little bit hard to visualize what's going on underground. And so I wanted to label some of the parts. What we're looking at here is the ground surface. And you can see it's sloped. The ground is sloped, as it is in our example. Here is a manhole. Here's the other manhole that it's connected to. And here is a conduit connecting the two manholes. Um, the ground elevation will be different from place to place. But actually, the way that StormCAD calculates is it doesn't have to know the ground elevation. It will give you a warning if the ground elevation is too close to the invert. But that's just uh, a warning. It won't kill your calculations if the ground elevations aren't entered or if, or if they're too shallow. On the other hand, the inverts have to be entered. And so let's say we've got an invert here, and it looks like this invert matches the bottom of the conduit. But in this case, the conduit comes in, and then there's a drop. And so the reason why I point that out is just to illustrate that sometimes the invert of a a uh, conduit is not the same as the invert of a catch basin, and that's OK. StormCAD knows how to handle those calculations. Um, we're going to be specifying the diameters of the conduits. If it, uh, you may come across the phrase crown, and the crown is talking about the top of the pipe. And so if there is an invert elevation of 96 feet and a crown, elevation, that's the inside diameter, the top of the inside diameter, then obviously this is a one foot diameter pipe because those two elevations differ by um, one foot. All right, so let's start up uh, StormCAD. There it is, StormCAD. And um, I gave you instructions on how you can download the installation files for your own computer if you've got a Windows PC. I logged into this one for you. We'll have to figure out why it's not able to log on for you. Um, now, as a reminder, I'm recording this presentation. And so if there's anything that you have trouble with today and you're not able to keep up, then you can just watch the recording later and hopefully that will um, make it easier for you to understand how to do StormCAD. So we're just going to start with this, and we're going to draw the skeleton of the network. Um, I'm going to dim the light so it's easier for you to see what I'm doing on the screen there. And we're going to start with create a new project. Does everybody have StormCAD open on their computer? I'll give you a minute. If you're using those tablets, they're awfully slow. 
And uh, if you prefer to have a mouse, there's a couple of uh, mice in the box here rather than the touchpad. I don't think the touchpad's very easy to use. We've only got maybe three mice back up there. But once you've got it started, then just click on Create a New Project. You just want the one that's standalone, not integrated with MicroStation, if those are the two options it's giving you. Now, it looks like this is an old version of StormCAD that's on this computer. You can see it says Select Series 3. If you've installed it on your own PC, I think it says Select Series 5. Anybody here have it installed? Four. Okay, it must be four that's the new one. That's fine. Most of it's the same. Uh, there will be a few little differences here and there, but that's not a, a critical issue. One of the most important things to start off with is to look at the units. And so if you go to Tools, we want to make sure... Now, this problem we're going to work is in uh, traditional units. And so if you go to Tools, Options units, you see it already says here US customary. The other option is SI. So if it says SI, switch it to US customary because we want it to be in US customary for this example that we're working. And in fact, it's a little, it's a strange thing with Bentley that in the past if I change unit systems, even at the beginning of a project, it somehow messes up the project. So if you change it, then close the file and uh, start a new one if you ever make a change. Now, if it was already in U.S. customary, then that's fine. But when you're switching between the two, it's like you re really need to fully start over again or else there's some kind of weirdness with the units. All right. Um, now, when we were doing water CAD, uh, water gems back in hydraulic engineering, you'll remember one of the other preliminary things that we changed was we changed it to Darcy Wiesbach, right? Because the default energy loss um, method was Hayes and Williams. We don't need to worry about that here. In this, it's always going to use Manning's equation for estimating the, uh, the flow through the pipe because here we have partially full pipes rather than uh, pressurized flow. And so it's using Manning's equation in order to know the flow through the pipe. And it's going to use the rational method for finding the peak runoff from catchments. So they're the only preliminary thing we have to do is change the units. Okay, any questions so far? Is everybody got the screen up and ready to go? Okay, we're going to draw a network. And the network we're going to draw is very simple. We're going to have an inlet here. It's going to go to an inlet there. One here, one more inlet, and then we're going to have an outfall. Now, that's, the outfall isn't shown on our network, but we have to have somewhere for the water to come out of the network, just for computational purposes. So that's what we're going to do. So when I begin to draw, I click here on Layout Conduit. Now, it's giving me the wrong symbol right now. The default thing that it's saying is it wants to draw a manhole, but I want to have an inlet there. A manhole won't accept water, but this catch basin will. So if I right click, so right here it wants to drop a manhole somewhere. So if you right click, then you change it to catch basin, and then you can drop a catch basin. You can see it says catch basin one. Now I'm just going to draw a symbolic network. It's not going to be scaled to length. I have no picture in the background that I'm drawing on, drawing on top of. And so um, I'm going to enter the length manually later. So it doesn't matter how long this line is. It doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm going to drop another catch basin. Put one over here. And I have to press escape to start over switch it to catch basin again, have one here for 3.1, and now right click, and I want it to be an outfall. I'm putting in the outfall and escape. So this is what your network should look like at this point, and I can move the things around if I want to. 
just to give it more breathing room. You can use this arrow to move things side to side. If you want the lines to be perfectly straight, you can make little adjustments. But we just want the structure of a network so far. Okay? Yes, Andrew? Uh huh. Just connect the dots. Okay. Well, won't just apart. no, it won't. It just draw right on top of it. It'll connect them. It's okay. Just go right from there to there. No, right on top. Escape. Okay. Use that. Select it and delete it. Okay. Draw again right on top, and then it'll connect the dots. Okay, a question came up is like if you have a if you have a catch basin here and one there, how do you connect them? You just go to conduit and right click catch basin and it won't draw another one. If you if you drop it right on top, it'll just connect the other ones that were there. And if you do something that you need to delete it, then you use the arrow button, you can draw a box. It'll select things, then you press the delete button and they go away. When you're using a new program for the first time, it's hard to uh, sometimes even just draw lines until you get acquainted with the symbols and the functions there. Outfall. Yep. So just uh, click the triangle and click it right on top. It will change. Oh, I got a good question about the numbers. Do the numbers matter? And it looks like you've maybe got two things there. Let's, uh, delete one of them. Yeah, OK. What? That's okay. Is something missing? No, no, it's only when you are uh, dropping it that you get those options. So if you're drawing, like here, drawing the pipe, okay, conduit. Mm -hmm. Just what I need. Yeah, okay, conduit. Mm -hmm. Now if you right click, there's oh, the options. Okay. All right, so um, what we're going to do now, we've drawn the network. Let's pull open the catch basin table. Here is the uh, flex table, is how you get to the catch basins. Okay, so look for it. It looks like a little table and it has the triangle to the side of it. And you click on the triangle, and we're going to start with the catch basin flex table. All right, and it's covering up too much of my screen, so I'm going to change the size of it. The first thing I want to do is change the names because in my network, what it says here is catch basin 1, I actually am calling 1.1. So I can just type that in. And now catch basin 2, if I look at my paper, that should be 2.1. Catch basin 3, that should be 1.2, and so on. So just rename the network according to what's on the paper. And it automatically, anytime you change the table, then it automatically reflects that change in the entire network, including the database in the background and the picture that's on the screen. You don't have to like save. Just any time you type in a field and move to the next one, it automatically will save. <coughs> All right, so change the label. Also, you can type in the ground elevation. Now, I got the ground elevation from the contours that are on the map. And to me, it looked like I had 734 as the elevation for 1.1. 727 is the ground elevation for both 1.2 and 2.1. Uh, 3.1, 723. That looked like the ground elevation to me. What we have the firm information on, though, is the uh, invert elevation. I'm going to. I want to move the invert elevation column over, so I'm going to click that, and I'm going to drag it over, and now that changed where the invert column is. So that's pretty handy. 
Now I can make this smaller and see again. And so invert elevation from the table that's here, here it says junction 1.1 has 730.5. Uh, 1.2 is 723.45. 2.1, 722.7, and 718.36. So just typing in the elevation. So here, ground elevation, 1.1, I think, uh, maybe um, 7.30, I had 7.34, so 7.34, ground elevation for 2.1, 727, 727, and 7.23. Okay, and then invert elevation you get from here, okay? Just one second. Oh, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I've got a question about the order that it's in, and that's actually an important point because if you draw your network in a different order, then it's going to label them different. And in fact, the, the direction that you draw your network, it is going to assume that the water goes from the origin towards the destination. So, for example, I clicked here and then I clicked there. So the computer thinks water should go from here to there. And that's true. It should be going that direction. But then, after I got here, then I clicked from here to there. And so I told the computer that the water should be going that way. And so I need to remember, or I can look it up later, in just a moment I'm going to double check that all of the flow directions are correct. And I'm going to have to swap that flow direction because I clicked here and then there. But the order that you see those, um, it doesn't really matter ultimately, except for that flow direction that we're going to check later when we have the conduit pipe, uh, conduit table open. <coughs> okay, so the important thing here, like I said before, you could have zero for the ground elevation and it would just give you a minor warning. The ground elevation doesn't matter so much. What really matters is the invert elevation. Okay, that's the most important thing is the invert elevation. We changed the name, we did the invert elevation. Uh, one other important thing is if you open up the table all the way, you will find here, uh, oh, it's not showing. All right, this is good. There's lots of additional columns that can be displayed that aren't being shown right now. So this is very important. Watch how you add a new column. Over here is this edit button. It looks like yellow with a pencil. So click on edit, oh no, not that one, yeah, okay, edit, and scroll down, and we're looking for one that's called inlet location. So scroll down looking for inlet location, there it is. And then we have to add it to the list of columns that are shown. So you click inlet location, you add, and now we can see here is inlet location, okay. And now if I scroll over, it will say inlet location. Yeah. Okay, so look across the top. Here's all the symbols. The one we want is the edit, yellow pad with a pencil. So you click edit, and it brings up the list. Yeah, some of you might already have inlet location if somebody added it previously when using... Inlet location. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe it's already on your computer if you're using one of the tablets. No, uh, US. OK, does everybody have inlet location as one of the columns? Still doing the invert? That's OK. Maybe it is. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So inlet location and add. So click that button. Uh huh. Okay. And now scroll over to the very side. Down here. All right. All right, the reason why we have that inlet location thing shown is um, it needs to do like a ton of extra calculations and you have to put in a bunch of additional information if it's on grade because it wants to try and find out how much of the water will actually make it into that catch basin. It's much easier if you tell it that the catch basin is going to be in a sag. Like if the road is going downwards and the catch basin is at the bottom of that sag, then the computer knows it's going to capture all of the water. And so instead of having it go through all the extra calculations of trying to figure out how efficient the catch basin is at intercepting flow, we're going to change it from on grade and put it to in sag. Otherwise, we'll get a critical error and the calculations won't work. So this is a very important point, and you will definitely probably get an error message when you're doing the homework because you'll forget to do this, and then when you get that critical error message, you'll remember, oh yeah, it's all about the sag. So you'll go back to inlet location and everything will be fixed when you remember that. All right, because I do the same thing. Every year I forget, I get the critical error message and then I think, oh yeah, sag, and then it's fine. Okay. So that's all we've done for the catch basin table. Now let's go to the conduit table. So to open up the tables, you go here. And conduit is another word for pipe. I think they call it conduit here instead of pipe because sometimes in stormwater uh, networks, you'll have um, non-pipe conduits. Like you may have a rectangular culvert or an arch pipe of some sort. So open up the conduit and the first thing is we're going to change the names. For example, this first pipe, conduit 1, is what I call pipe A. And then uh, conduit 2 is pipe B and so on. All right. Now I mentioned that the flow direction is going to be screwed up for one of my pipes because I drew from here to there. And the way that you know that is look at the start node versus the stop node. Let me move that column over so it's easier to see. I'm going to move the stop node over here. Okay, so pipe A, it says it goes from 1.1 to 2.1, so that's okay. Pipe B, it goes from 2.1 to 1.2. The start and the stop are wrong in pipe B. Can you see how I've got mine says it goes from 2.1 towards 1.2? So I need to fix that. And the way to fix it is I'm going to double click on the pipe itself and it'll bring up a big table. So if I have this selection tool and I double click on pipe B, it's going to bring up the properties for that pipe. And here is this line that says node reversal. And you can see the start is 2.1, the stop is 1.2. So any pipe that you have where the start and the stop are wrong, you need to reverse the nodes by going here to the properties table for that element. And as soon as I click on this ellipsis, the dot, 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 it's going to swap the start and the stop. So now you can see it's fixed. It thinks it's beginning at 1.2 and going towards 2.1, and that's correct. So I can close the properties, and it also updated the information here in the table. 
All right, and I'll check to make sure everything else is fine too. From 2.1 towards 3.1, from 3.1 towards the outlet. All right. So let's also put in the length because remember the pipe lengths that it has right now are just based on where we clicked on the screen. So we need to tell it how long is the pipe. And so here has user defined length. We need to turn that on for each of the pipes because we the user are going to tell the system directly instead of by the drawing how long it is. We're going to type it in. And so pipe A has a length of, from the table it says here, 390. Pipe B, 183. Pipe C, 177. Now this pipe isn't really in the network. It's imaginary. It has to be there because I have to have an outfall somewhere. And so I'm just going to say it's 10 feet long. Make it short and we're going to make it a big diameter pipe. Add the column. Has user, um, scroll down to, has user defined length. You may not have the user defined length column, so you need to add that the same way that we added the other one. It's under H, has user defined length. <laughs> Yeah, seems weird that they put it under H, but that's where it is. Yeah. So you have to click here, and now it will allow you to. Yep. Yep. Um, I don't know what that means. Uh, there's a lot of columns here that I don't use, and so why don't you take it off? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You have to click the box, has user defined length. Yep. Okay. So we put in the lengths. Did it give you the column now? as user defined length. All right. You're trying to do the pipes now, the conduit? No, I'm trying to. You're doing other stuff? Okay. What number did you put in there? Just a random number? 10 for the last one, yeah. Okay, so we told it pipe lengths. Um, you know, another thing it will show here is the Manning's N. And if you remember in the example that our Manning's N value was 0 0.014, but it's thinking the default should be 0 0.013 because Somewhere here we've specified the material type. Uh, it's not shown, but if I add the column, probably there's a column that says material. There it is, material. Strange that it wouldn't be one of the defaults. But you can pick a certain material and then it will put in the C value that goes along with that material. Um, I'm not going to pick one, though. I want to change all of these n values together. There's not too many of them. Like, I could do 0 .014, enter, 0 .014, enter. Or, there's the option, if you right-click at the top, there is global edit. And if I want to global edit set value 0 .014, enter, then it will do all of them simultaneously. So again, you find the column, right-click, global edit.
All right. Um, also, here is the diameter. The diameter hopefully is showing. If, if your conduit diameter isn't showing, then you have to go here to edit and have it show. Okay, so make sure that diameter is available. And that's all we're going to do right now with the conduit table. So I can close the conduit table. And uh, the next thing I want to do is I need to put an invert elevation for my outfall. So if you just double click on the outfall and we will find elevation, scrolling down, here it is. Uh, no, that's elevation invert. Okay. So the invert elevation of pipe 3.1 was 718, so I'm going to make this 715. Remember, this element is imaginary. It exists just because every network has to have some place where the water comes out. Otherwise, it won't do the calculations. And so this outfall is just, it's make-believe. Um, so that after the water goes through this inlet, it exits the network somewhere. I could also go here to outfall. And you can see invert elevation I can type in. I'll put in the ground elevation, but it's not important. I'll put 723, but it's, it'll still calculate even if you don't specify a ground elevation. All right, so um, think, about, Matt, uh, think about the rational method. Q equals CIA. Have we defined everything that we need to define in order for it to say what is the flow rate through the pipe? Because ultimately, like, what's the whole point of this simulation? Does anybody know? Maybe I should have started there. What's the whole point of this simulation? It's to say how big should the pipe be? You know, right now, the default, it says every pipe should be 12 inches. That was the default size. If you look at the conduit table, it says right now every pipe diameter is 12 inches. And so it's going to run a simulation to say how much flow there is. And we told it where the pipe elevations are and how long it is. And so we told the system how steep is the pipe. With the n value, the roughness coefficient, we are able to use Manning's equation to find the capacity of the pipe. But what about the hydrology? Have we told it everything it needs to know to find out what is the flow rate? Not by a long shot. We still have to tell it the storm data, because remember, Q equals CIA. We still have to define a storm. We still have to put in C values. And we haven't specified the area that is contributing to the flow. So we've done the hydraulics part so far. And now what we're going to do is switch into the hydrology by defining catch, uh, catchments. Any questions about that overview? Because it's, it's important not to get so focused on turning on a column that we forget, really, what's the whole objective of the simulation. OK, so the next thing I'm going to do is here's the symbol that says catchment. And I'm going to draw a little catchment that is simulating the area that flows into this inlet. So, it doesn't matter the size, because just like with the pipe length, this is going to be a user-defined catchment. So I'm going to put in some area, and then I will right-click and done. And I will put in some area here. Doesn't matter where I click, and it doesn't even have to be so that it's overlapping with the catchment. It can, but it doesn't have to be. Done. Here, the shape is irrelevant. I mean, you could have it scaled if you wanted to, if you have a map in the background, and it will calculate the area automatically. But I'm going to be typing in the area. So the shape doesn't matter. There's a lot of information we have to tell it about the catchment. We have to tell it what is the C value for the catchment, what is the area, and also we're going to change the names to be consistent with 
what we have on the example. Okay, so the example, I'm going to open up the table here, the table for the catchment, and move it to the side so I can keep looking at my network when I make changes. Okay. First of all, I will change this and call it catchment 1.1. I'm calling this catchment 1.2, and so on. The catchments are named after the uh, inlets that they feed to. They have the same name. All right. I need to tell it the area of each catchment, and that's on the given table here. 1.1 has an area of 2.2 acres, 1.2 acres, 3.9, and 0.7. We also type in the C value from the table that's given. Okay, so the C value, 0.65, Point eight, point seven, and point seven. The last thing that we have in our catchment table on the paper is it says the time of concentration in minutes. So we'll find the time of concentration, but it says hours. So we can do the calculations and, you know, the first one is 11 minutes. And so in my calculator, I can do 11 divided by 60 and then type that in here in hours. Or maybe even easier, if I right click on the column, change the units and formatting. And here you can see unit is hours. I want it to say minutes because that's what I have the data. And I don't want it to say 60.000 minutes, so I'm just going to have it say one display precision and OK. And so now I can put in for 1.1, it was 11 minutes, 9.2 minutes, 13.7, and so on. All right? We're almost finished with the catchments. There's still one really important thing that we have to do before the catchments will make sense to the computer. It still doesn't know which catchment feeds which catch basin. Because remember, we can draw them anywhere on screen, and uh, it doesn't have any idea the relationship between where the catchment is and where is the inlet that the water goes to. Okay, and do runoff coefficient. Let's see, I think the runoff coefficient is, yeah, this one, runoff coefficient. Yeah. Was that already there? Yeah, that was there already, right? Yeah, the, uh, some, the different versions have different titles. For example, remember I'm using here Select Series 3. In Select Series 4, which is the new version that you can download now, instead of it says Rational C, what does it say on yours? Runoff coefficient? Yeah, runoff coefficient. So they changed some of the table titles, but don't let that throw you off. Um, just have to search a little bit. Okay, now is a really fun part. This has all been super fun so far, but this part's fun because now we get to... Uh, well, you'll see why it's fun. Let's see. There is a uh, link to inlet outflow. We have to make sure that that title is here. It's not. So edit. I'm looking for, huh. now the titles have changed. Now I have to figure out, let's see.
That might be it. No. All right. Well, we'll do it the old-fashioned way. Oh, outflow element. I bet that's what it is. Yep, outflow element. On uh, version four, it's called link to um, inlet outflow element. Let's see. Do you see what? Is it just the outflow element? Let's see. Scroll down. Are you in the catchment table? Okay. Close that. Let's see what you got already. Outflow element. Okay, yeah, it's outflow element. I got outflow node, outflow element. All right, so click on the ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. And what it's going to do is uh, it wants to know for this catchment, which catch basin should it go to. So click on the catch basin that you want the flow to go to. And so you see this little dotted line? It's going to say that all of the water from this area will go into that inlet. So now 1.2, I click on the dot, 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 and I want it to go into that inlet. So I'm just telling it the structure of where the flow should enter the network. And I don't know why that seems fun to me, but it does. It's the little pleasures in life. All right. So that's the last thing that we have to do on the catchment table. And once that's defined, by the way, it's always a good habit to save your work. So find a, a directory on the hard drive where you can save. So file, save as. I'm going to put it in a folder. I'm going to just start a little temporary directory in here. I'm going to call it CE433. And this is in class example. Because it would be terrible if the battery dies or on these uh, Windows tablets, they have a habit of installing updates suddenly with no warning. And so you're in the middle of an exam, and all of a sudden it will install Windows updates, and you'll lose your work. <laughs> it's one of the many reasons why I love it when you install the software on your own personal computer instead of us having to use these awful tablets. So save your work. And I wanted to point out that actually it creates a pretty big file. It's not very efficient. <laughs> It's got this uh, 11 megabyte database file. We haven't done anything to justify a database file that big, but you have to have all four of these files. You can't just email yourself one of them. All of these files is what you need to open up the uh, network later on. So always save your work. That's a good habit. Um, so we defined our catch basins, conduit, outfall, catchment. The last thing we have to do is tell it about the storm. If you look at the uh, figure here, we have the curve that says 5 minute duration, 5.4 inches per hour, 10 minute storm duration, 4.2 inches per hour, and so on. This, by the way, is a uh, 25 year storm. And it doesn't say that, but let's say that this is a 25 year storm. So here under components, we're going to put in storm data. So along the menu where it says components, storm data. And it looks like we could also define that by using one of the little buttons here. The storm data button, wherever that is. Component storm data. And we're going to start a new user-defined IDF table. So click here and then user-defined IDF table. This means start a new one. And then we get this new screen over here. OK, so we have to give it add a return period. And it's a 25-year storm. OK. And then we're going to add durations. So we want to add a five-minute duration, add duration 10. I've never done add range before. I'm not going to do it. Add duration uh, 15, and so on through 60. So let me just show you one more time how I got into this area to begin with. So components, storm data, and then 
click user defined IDF table and then click here to begin a new one. Since I've already started, I'll just go to the one that I've already begun. Uh huh. You have to put in a return period first. And so here, add a return period and then go over here to add durations. So first add, you have to have some return period and then you can start adding the durations. And then I'm going to put in the intensity 5.4 and just entering in that data from the table. Okay. Everybody's keeping up so well today. That's great. If there was a certain part that didn't make sense to you or you had to skip over, the recording will be posted in about one hour after class, and so you can always go back to it. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, all right. So that's all. We, we have now told it what this storm looks like. This is what a 25-year storm looks like, say close. And then here in components, global storm events, this is where we're going to tell it that it should use that 25-year storm. It's a two-step process. First, you have to define what the storm looks like. And you maybe would put in lots of different storms. You would put in a five-year storm, a two-year storm, a 25-year storm and put it in the background, and then you can do multiple simulations with different storm sizes. For this example, we're only going to define the 25-year storm. So go into global storm events, and then under global storm event, the drop-down box will use that, that one that we've got selected, 25-year storm. And there's always so many columns that mean nothing, like orphan local. I don't know why it says orphan local, but you get very good at ignoring things when you use this software. Um, just made you want to think of the orphans, I guess. Close that, and we're ready to begin the simulation. Remember, to start the simulation is the compute button, and you have it compute. Convergence was achieved is what we're looking for. That's, that's happy news. If we hadn't done the SAG, remember inlet location is in the SAG, then it, we'd, instead of yellow, we would have a bunch of red exclamation points instead of the yellow warnings. It's giving us some warnings, but that's okay. Let's see, what are the warnings it's saying? Um, the slope is nearly zero. The invert is lower than the bottom of the structure it connects to. Not enough cover. So if you were actually going to build this network, those would be good warnings to pay attention to. If the slope is too shallow, maybe sediment will accumulate. If there's not enough cover, a car can drive over the pipe and it will collapse. So these are good to pay attention to, but for our simulation, we're not going to worry about it. Um, but what's interesting to look at is it's showing the flow direction with the little arrows there. That's good. Looks like the flow directions are correct. And if we go to the table for the conduit, then you can see the main one I want to look at, um, it maybe isn't showing yet. Let's see. flow rate. So I'm going to add flow rate, flow. Oh, is flow already on here? Oh, okay. Here's flow and capacity. So we should have flow listed as one of them. Oh, here it is. Flow. CFS. So if you go to the example solution, let's just uh, 
change the diameters to match what we came up with because remember this is just all for 12 inch so I can right click and change that to feet okay I will show two digits and then pipe A in our example had a diameter of 1.25 Pipe B had a diameter of 1.5. Pipe C was 1.75. And pipe D is imaginary. I'm just going to leave it 1.75. And then the flow. So we can compare that 5.77. Look at the spreadsheet that I gave you on the example that we did. It says that the flow rate would be 5.72. So that's very, very close to the 5.77 that's predicted here. Why the difference? Probably because the computer is better at interpolating the intensity than we are. Because what it's doing is it's looking at that rainfall curve and it's picking out what intensity it should use for the time of concentration of 11 minutes. All right, pipe B, we said pipe B should be carrying 4.13. And here, it's pretty close to that, 4.25. And again, the difference is because of the way that it's looking up the intensity based on time of concentration. Pipe C, our example said 18.8 CFS. Here it's saying 17.8. So it's matching up pretty well. How big should the pipes be, though? Uh, I'm surprised that it's not calculating this capacity full flow because uh, yours is doing it? Yeah, it's not doing it on mine. Everybody has a full flow capacity? Well, let me go to one where it is because I've got this example up on my computer in my office. Okay, so if I open up the uh, conduit table, here it's showing the uh, capacity full flow. And so if, if it is, uh, another one that's interesting to look up is flow relative to capacity slash design. So it's telling you how percent full it is. So you can play around with the size. If I change this from 15 to 12, now it's 12 inches, then that's too small because it's at 123% capacity. So I can say, what about a 15-inch pipe? And so on. So we're out of time. Um, okay, that's the demo for um, StormCAD. Last semester I taught you how to do annotations, and you're going to need to do annotations again. Some of you didn't have me last semester, so I have a video that shows you how to draw the annotations and on the homework assignment that I'm going to give you right now, um, on the second page, I think it's on the second page, yeah, I have um, two videos that I'm linking to. One video shows you how to do annotation and one shows you how to print. Briefly, what the annotation, in, that's just labels. So if I wanted to have a conduit like the pipe length, right click, new, right click new annotation and I can have it say the length um, find length and then I'll have L equals and then apply it then that shows me the length of my pipe it has a, a label for that so let me give you a copy of this the assignment is due on Thursday. That doesn't give you very much time. But the good news is that um, I've got office hours between now and then. You can you know, work on this collaboratively, collaboratively with your classmates. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to help you out. Um, this software is installed on the computers that are out in the lobby, or you can install it on your own PC. 
but unfortunately the tablets are going to be locked up in the cart, and so the tablet computers aren't available outside of class hours. Maybe I should say fortunately. But here you go. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you on Thursday.